Thank you. I would like to call this meeting to order. This is a Redmond City Council study session held on Tuesday, May 23rd, 2022, commencing at 7 p.m. Council members in attendance are Council Member Kahn, Council Member Fields, Council Member Anderson, myself, Council Member Forsyth, Council Member Kritzer, and Council Member Carson. There are four items on the agenda tonight, 2023 legislative session debrief, 2024 legislative uh, brainstorm, 2023 council priority results and discussion, and council talk time. First up, we have our legislative session debrief with Amy Sai, Chief Policy Advisor, introducing the item. Welcome. Thank you, Council President. Amy Sai, Chief Policy Advisor, and with me today is Brianna Murray, our state lobbyist. And we are here today to provide an overview of the 2023 state legislative session. I'm sorry, I don't see my screen sharing yet. So today um, we're going to, I'm going to provide a quick overview of the city's legislative program. And then Brianna Murray is going to cover the outcomes from the 23, 2023 legislative session and how we fared on the city's priorities. And then we will briefly talk about next steps with you. As an overview of the city's legislative program, as you know, the mayor recommends and you, the council adopts the state legislative agenda. And that state agenda does guide our city lobbying and advocacy efforts. And I was able to experience firsthand this session, what that really meant and, and how that truly is a guiding document um, for our work. And we're really fortunate in having Brianna here as our state lobbyist to lead our advocacy efforts. I also got a front row seat to that this session for the first time and just so impressed and thankful for all of her work and expertise in guiding us through this process. So just very thankful um, for our lo strong lobbyist support, supporting our interests. Um, so uh, during session, communication is key. And we signaled to you at the start of the session that it was important that we keep a two-way communication open. And so as part of our efforts through that process, you all received weekly reports. We gave you bill status updates on a week by week basis and also the upcoming public hearings that were happening real time. And so we're hoping that you found those weekly updates helpful and we're definitely gonna be, I'll definitely be connecting with you uh, to find out any uh, suggestions you may have um, for information that you received during the session. Um, also part of that effort was notifying you of opportunities to testify. So very grateful for your active participation. Um, we also had AWC days, Association of Washington City days, where many of you traveled uh, down to Olympia to represent the city and express our priorities to the state legislature. Um, so that was uh, a really great opportunity and uh, wonderful to have your engagement and the strength of your voices behind uh, the city's asks. And of course, we also encourage communication from you on uh, anything that you were engaged in. And it was obvious to me that you were making a concerted effort to do that outreach during session. And we're really appreciative of that. Uh, so that's essentially the program in a nutshell. And I'm now gonna turn it over to Brianna to cover the outcomes. Great. Well, thank you, Amy, for your kind words. And I'll just note that it was a team effort um, with Amy, as well as many other members of city of staff to advance the city's legislative priorities this set legislative session. Um, I'm gonna start first with just an overview of the 2023 session that is providing you with context. Um, and then we'll go in more specifically and talk about the specific city of Redmond legislative priorities. Uh, so the legislature operates on a two year cycle with uh, the first year being a long legislative session and the second year being a short legislative session. The 2023 session was the first year of the, that two year cycle and a long legislative session scheduled to last 105 days. It started on January January 9th and ended on April 23rd. And throughout that time, they worked holidays, weekends, late nights, early mornings. It really is all consuming for our legislators and certainly all consuming for myself um, as we do a deep dive into that legislative process. 
Um, in the short legislative session, it will be 60 days in 2024, and the activities will look a little bit different. Leading up to the 2023 legislative session, um, we had the November 2022 elections, um, where nearly all the members of the House and half the members of the Senate were up for re-election. That election cycle brought 25 new members of the legislature uh, to us. And for many other sophomore, member, sophomore legislators, where this was their second term, this was all of their first in-person legislative session. The legislature had not met in person um, in 2021 or in 2022. So during the first few weeks of session, there were a lot of people looking to find where the bathrooms were located. Um, <laughs> and it was also really great to uh, see individuals familiarize themselves with the in-person dynamics of session. You had a lot of committee chairs or vice chairs who had never done in-person committee action. Um, and so it was just a really great experience from that regard. Um, through, the, through the elections, Democrats gained an additional seat in each legislative chamber, which meant the political balance for this session was that there were 58 Democrats and 40 Republicans in the House, 29 Democrats and 20 Republicans in the Senate, uh, so strong Democrat majorities. Uh, having strong Democrat majorities allowed the Democrats to establish the main themes of the legislative session, many of which ended up being bipartisan efforts. Um, the 2023 session was declared early on as the year of housing. Additionally, the legislature prioritized continuing its conversation around public safety policies, addressing climate change, protect protecting reproductive rights, investing in behavioral health workforce, and fully funding special education, many other items as well. Um, within those buckets and many others, the legislature considered 2,156 bills uh, and 485 of those passed into law. In comparison to the 2021 legislative session, or sorry, yes, 2021 legislative session, the last long legislative session, this was a significant increase in the number of bills introduced and a significant increase in the number of bills passed into law. As is typical at the beginning of a legislative biennium, legislators were appointed to new committees, committees were restructured, um, and committee chairs were selected. Uh, notably, several of Redmond's legislators from the 45th and 48th districts were elected to key positions. Uh, the city of Redmond is well served by now some of the more senior members of the legislature. They've advanced themselves to these key chair positions and leadership positions, um, which allows them to be really effective advocates on behalf of the community. The legislature's primary task during the long legislative session uh, is to develop a biennial operating capital and transportation budget. So in addition to all of those over 2,000 bills, they're also drafting that biennial budget. The state's fiscal year begins on July 1st of 2023, so the budgets that they just adopted will become effective July 1st and will remain in effect until June 30th of 2025. And in the 2024 session, they'll do mid-biennium adjustments through a supplemental budget. The state's three budgets have distinct purposes and funding sources. The state's operating budget funds all uh, state agency budgets so Department of Social and Human Services, Department of Ecology, uh, any state agency is funded out of that budget as far as operations. It also funds all the operations for the K through 12 education system, the higher education system, and most social services. Um, that the operating budget is funded with property sales, B&O, real estate, and other tax collections. Um, and the 23-25 budget was a $69.8 billion budget, um, which is a net increase of $2.4 billion from the previous biennium. The legislature held $3.6 billion in reserves uh, and um, made significant investments in the K through 12 special education funding, behavioral health, and housing and homeless supports. The state's capital budget funds bricks and mortar construction that is not transportation. So think 
buildings, <laughs> not roads. Uh, it is funded by bonds that a percentage of the operating budget are dedicated to paying off. Uh, the, um, because it is funded with bonds, it, it does need to be approved in a bipartisan fashion. So this is often and continued to be this year a, a bipartisan approved bill. The capital budget was $9 billion, and within that, some of the large investments um, included $400 million dedicated to the Housing Trust Fund and over $200 million in community projects. The third budget is the state's transportation budget. It is funded primarily with gas tax and Climate Commitment Act revenues. Uh, there are two transportation packages that the legislature has been focused on implementing. The first is the 15-year uh, 2015 Connecting Washington package, and the second is the 2022 16-year Move Ahead Washington package. So, you, so in each of those years, they took votes to issue bonds to fund projects going out into future years. And they're working on ensuring that funds are able to be allocated to the project commitments that were made in each of those packages. The uh, transportation budget was uh, $13.5 billion. Um, we'll get into this a little bit more but when we talk about our specific project, but I'll note that when the governor signed the transportation budget into law, he cautioned that he had a lot of concerns with the budget that the legislature had adopted. Um, he feels very strongly that the State Department of Transportation is unable to deliver the projects on the timelines and under the phasing that was outlined by the legislature, and then issued a rather stern lecture when he signed the budget, uh, indicating that there needed to be more work in the legislative interim and changes made in the 2024 session. Subsequent to adjourning on April 23rd, the legislature did need to convene for a one-day special session on May 16th to adopt a policy regarding possession of controlled substances. Uh, they weren't able to reach agreement on that during the 105-day session and had to come back for that one-day session to adopt a policy. So with that broad overview of some of the, the different dynamics, both politically and the large tasks, I want to transition and talk a little bit more specifically about the City of Redmond's top priority issues. So you all adopt a legislative agenda that has, uh, this past session that had two, sorry, three top priority items. Uh, we focused our advocacy efforts on these three items. Um, and this focus not only helps us steer our resources, but it also helps bring focus to our legislators who are also serving in leadership positions and committee chairs and are engaged on issues far beyond just those items identified in the city's legislative agenda. Um, so this year we had three priority items and then in addition to that we have a support opposed monitor list that provides direction on how the city engages on a plethora of other issues. And for these issues, City of Redmond is not the lead advocate. We are however dedicating staff time to reviewing the bills, assessing their impact on Redmond and providing input on those bills both in written form and verbally in testimony, and I, having a direct, uh, I think, impact on different proposals that are coming forward from other stakeholders. So top priority items where we're leading, if Redmond wasn't bringing the issue forward, it wouldn't be coming forward. Support opposed monitor issues are more us reacting to proposals coming forward in the process. So on our top priority items, the first one was a funding request within the capital budget for relocation of Evans Creek. You'll recall that this project benefits salmon habitat, reconnects the floodplain, and improves recreational access. Uh, usually when we're advancing funding requests within the capital budget, we aim high and expect less. Um, and that is exactly what happened this legislative session. We requested $1.761 million for the project, knowing that that was not a likely amount to receive. Um, and uh, we did receive $1.03 million, uh, uh, $1 million <laughs> in the uh, capital budget, um, which is a sizable amount. The average appropriation to projects within the capital budget was just slightly over 700,000. So as has been the case uh, for the last few legislative sessions that I've worked on with the city, Redmond received more than the average community um, and that is a true testament to your advocates in the 45th and uh, 48th districts. 
I'll note that all members of our legislative delegation advocated for the funding for this project, um, and a special kudos to Senator Dingra and Representative Goodman, who took the lead on the request. I'll also note that one of the reasons I think we were successful in in securing funding for this request and at the dollar amount that we secured it was a lot of our work leading up to the beginning of the legislative session. Um, Council Member uh, Kritzer, you joined us uh, as well as uh, the mayor on tours with members of our delegation of the project to allow them to actually see what it is that they would be advocating for during the legislative session. And I think those tours were instrumental in this success. Moving on to the next priority item is the 148th Bicycle and Pedestrian Overpass Funding. This is a project that we've been working on for several legislative sessions. Uh, in 2022, when the legislature adopted the 16-year Move Ahead Washington package, uh, we were able to secure uh, within that package $8 million for the 148th Bike Ped Path Over 520. However, when the legislature adopted the Move Ahead Washington package, they said, we're planning to fund all these projects over 16 years, but they didn't tell us what projects would receive what funding in what years. Uh, they said, we'll do that in 2023. So this legislative session, they used uh, some equity criteria. They looked at other project funding matches that had been allocated, and they came up with a delivery schedule uh, for the first six years of the Move Ahead Washington package. Within that, we requested a timeline, as is outlined on the screen, that would have allocated funding to the project between 2023 and 2029. Um, unfortunately, we were not successful in getting our preferred phasing, and instead, the $8 million for this project is allocated to future biennia post-2029. So they allocated the project's funding, they allocated projects funding for the first six years, and there's a long list of projects that are in this future biennia category, and we are in that long list of projects. I think the reason that we ended up in that category um, is because there are no dollars currently allocated to this project. Um, so uh, the only funding is this $8 million. There's no matching dollars that are being leveraged. Um, and uh, the project did not rank very high on the equity criteria, um, just the and the low income uh, state health index didn't indicate that this was in, located in an area that ranked in great need on that statewide index. Uh, so um, moving forward, the legislature will be reevaluating that project phasing schedule, especially given the governor's comments about it not being sustainable. Uh, and as that is revisited, we have an opportunity to continue the conversation on this project and also continue to think about what changes we could make to better elevate the project moving forward, um, whether that's additional funding, applying to other grants, um, changing project scope, uh, anything along those lines or things uh, we'll be exploring uh, with city staff and department staff and some of your subject matter experts. Moving on to the third of your legislative priorities, this was the most ambitious of the of the, your top three legislative priorities, but also one of the most exciting and one of the greatest impacts that I think Redmond has had on uh, statewide policy since I've been working with the city. Um, so uh, this is the first time you all chose to lead in the request of an introduction of a piece of legislation. Uh, and the city requested a bill that would have allowed transportation impact fee revenue to be spent on bike, pe bike pedestrian paths that are separated from the road right away. As part of our work to advance this bill forward, uh, we worked very hard to establish a coalition of supporters, including the Association of Washington Cities, but also several individual cities that put this as a priority on their legislative agendas. Additionally, we had support from FutureWise, Transportation Choices Coalition, Washington Bikes, all great statewide organizations advancing multimodal transportation policy, and then some local, very, very important local partners like Move Redmond and East Rail Partners. 
Um, so that coalition of support was very helpful. Um, we were able to uh, secure sponsors for the bills and Senator Sharon Shoemake from the 42nd Legislative District and then our, our local representative Von Dennis Ladder from the 48th Legislative District. So we had companion bills to advance the conversation forward. Uh, Throughout the legislative process, we did hear opposition from the Master Builders Association and the Building Industry Association of Washington. Uh, we did early outreach to both of those stakeholders uh, in the November, December timeframe. So I had a sense of some of the opposition we would be facing. I don't think we fully understood quite the number of amendments we would be responding to um, that they would be requesting from legislators. So there were, throughout the course of the legislative process, probably a dozen uh, amendments offered on the bill, and each time we prepared talking points for our, our legislators, our key champions, to push back against those amendments. And the bill did pass into law with no amendments. Um, the Senate approved the bill 34 to 14 with a bipartisan vote, and 57 to 40 uh, in the House with one uh, pr pretty much party line vote with one Democrat being excused that day. Uh, so this is, I want to just emphasize, um, an example of where City of Redmond's leadership allows, you know, changes this state policy that is going to be beneficial to all Washington cities. And without Redmond having brought forward this bill, I don't think that another stakeholder was going to bring it to the table. So I think this is, one, a great example of a top priority issue, which is one where we're leading into a really good example of, of good use of resources and investment for not just Redmond, but also the greater good. And I'll just quickly chime in that a big thank you to the planning staff um, and other staff who really chimed in with their expertise as we were addressing each of those amendments that were coming in fast and often. So as far as your top priorities go, we accomplished two of three. We have more work to do on the bike ped path, but overall that's a pretty great outcome. Um, we'll transition now to talking about the support opposed monitor issues. Um, we did a significant amount of advocacy in this space, but again, it was really responding to proposals that were being introduced uh, into the process, and the city reviewed those bills, and uh, I just have to give a special kudos and thanks to city staff and an extra thanks to Carol Helland for dedicating a lot of time to reviewing bills, providing technical feedback. I do think through our advocacy in uh, our support opposed monitor issues that Redmond became very well known as offering constructive positive feedback to improve public policy at the statewide level um, and that we were not perceived as nitpicky or you know tearing apart proposals, but that it was all very positively received. We got very favorable comments from Representative Jessica Bateman, Representative Julia Reed, some of the other proponents of these large policies, and that the input Redmond specifically was providing was helping make the policies better, stronger, and more likely to pass. Um, and we saw a lot of bills pass this session, particularly in the space around housing. So the legislature approved House Bill 1110, which uh, requires cities to allow middle housing types when they update their next comprehensive plan update. Uh, we um, worked with Representative Jessica Bateman to uh, raise some technical implementation issues, and those were addressed early on, I think in large part due to our collaborative, rela collaborative relationship with her. Uh, and uh, the city was uh, supportive of the bill early on and far before most other cities. House Bill 1337 uh, requires cities to allow two ADUs per lots. Um, Senate Bill 5045 uh, is a bill sponsored by Senator Kuderer that the city was pretty active in supporting um, upon introduction. It authorizes cities in King County to provide a property tax exemption for ADUs that are rented to low-income households. House Bill 1293 requires cities to adopt an objective design criteria to reduce the amount of time it takes to issue permits for projects. Um, Senate Bill 5290 establishes statewide permitting timeline standards. 
House Bill 1042 is a bill that Representative Wallen introduced um, that reduced the requirements that must be met for projects that are converting from commercial or mixed use into residential. Um, and I, this was one where I do feel like the technical expertise that Redmond provided really helped shape the outcome of that bill, particularly through the Senate. Uh, Senate Bill 5412 um, establishes a SEPA exemption for housing, and again, that helps permitting processes go faster to reduce the cost of housing. On the funding side, the legislature um, authorized a uh, billion dollars in housing through the operating and capital budgets. Uh, they also toyed with the idea of increasing revenue for the purposes of housing. Uh, they considered a proposal that the governor brought forward to issue new voter approved bonds that would have generated $4 billion over several years. And they considered a proposal from Representative Frank Chop uh, that would have increased state real estate excise taxes and allowed cities to impose an additional quarter REIT for the purposes of housing. Uh, while neither of those pro proposals were approved, Redmond was very active in pushing for the need for additional funding for housing. Um, the mayor joined the mayors of Kirkland and Bellevue in a joint op-ed in the Seattle Times expressing support for additional housing investments. Um, and that was very meaningful to uh, the legislative dialogue on those issues. I do think the issue of whether to increase uh, housing funding for housing through new revenue will continue to be a conversation as we move to the 2024 session. The legislature also approved House Bill 1474, which uh, is a $100 document recording fee uh, to fund uh, down payment assistance to economic economically disadvantaged communities. I'll note that if you have some extra time on your hands, that watching the floor speeches associated with that bill can be, is very inspiring. It was a, a, one, of a prior, one of the priority bills um, for both sides of the aisle coming out of this legislative session and is really focused on creating those home ownership opportunities. So um, great bill there. I want to call out uh, another bill that the legislature considered but did not approve. That's Senate Bill 5466 uh, regarding transit-oriented development. This was governor request legislation that was sponsored by Senator Marco Elias and Representative Julia Reed and um, uh, strongly supported uh, by Amazon. And the bill, um, as introduced, had a lot of technical challenges. Uh, we worked closely with Representative Julia Reed to, to uh, develop a striking amendment to the bill that addressed most, if not all, of those technical concerns. Uh, and we're feeling pretty good about the outcome of that after she did significant stakeholder engagement. Um, unfortunately, there were many other stakeholders that still had outstanding concerns with the bill and it didn't pass this year. But I do expect it will come forward next session. One of the main tension points in the bill is whether or not when new when a statewide density mandate is authorized, whether that should come with a, an affordability requirement or not. Um, and d developers uh, advocated no, and housing advocates advocated yes. Now moving on to the next item on the support opposed monitor list is uh, environmental sustainability. Um, in the last three years, the legislature has boldly adopted a lot of big climate plans, the Climate Commitment Act, the, the uh, Low Carbon Fuel Standard, the Climate Energy Transformation Act. A lot of the climate advocacy this session focused on continued implementation of those big policies and then continuing to channel funding into important climate-related policies. Um, we did see one bill pass into law that's very meaningful. That's House Bill 1181, which integrates climate change into the GMA. That's a proposal that the city has supported for several legislative sessions, and it was good to get across the finish line. Uh, along with that bill, the legislature allocated $40 million in grants to local governments to do the additional planning work required under that bill. And I will just um, do a special thanks to Council President Forsyth for testifying in favor of that bill during the legislative session. 
We also were very supportive of product stewardship efforts. This year we saw a mixed bag of results. Uh, the product stewardship program for batteries was approved, but the large effort to create a comprehensive extended producer responsibility program to cover all products failed to pass this session. And I want to give a special call out to Councilmember Stewart who testified in support of that bill and also participated in a, an interim tour up in Vancouver, BC to try and advance that effort. Um, that is another item that while it didn't get across the finish line this year, I expect will come back in 2024. The budgets allocated uh, some significant funding, including $163 million for the Home Electrification and an Appliance Rebates Program, or HERE program, $120 million to incentivize zero emission, medium, and heavy-duty vehicles and associated charging infrastructure, uh, and many other accounts. I'll also note that there was a fairly robust discussion on House Bill 1589 to transition more homes from natural gas to electricity. Um, despite a lot of robust discussion, the bill didn't get across the finish line this session, and I do think that that will, again, be something that's revisited in 2024. Um, moving on to some more support opposed monitor issues. Under general government, the legislature considered but did not advance a proposal to adjust the property tax levy growth factor. They approved Senate Bill 5000 designating January as a Chinese American month. Um, and then additionally, a bill that Redmond had particular impact on was House Bill 1521, which places additional regulations on municipal self-insured employers. Um, really sort of technical and into the weeds type of a bill, but city department staff was able to provide some specific subject matter expertise feedback that allowed us to ask Senator Kuderer to offer an amendment to the bill that reduced the negative impacts to the city uh, and by clarifying that there is nothing in the bill that creates uh, additional liability through a private cause of action. Um, so this is a really good example of where we had no idea this bill was coming forward. Um, it was introduced, we had um, some great subject matter expertise here at city staff, and we were able to really influence the outcome of this bill to the benefit of the city, as well as all other self-insured employers. Under community vitality, uh, we saw significant investments in the behavioral health system, over 600 million, and approval of House Bill 1134, which continues to build out the 988 mental health crisis support system, and Senate Bill 5120, which is Senator Dingra's bill authorizing crisis response facilities. The legislature also allocated over $15 million to increase capacity at the Basic Law Enforcement Academy and on the gun safety front approved an assault rifle ban. There are some additional issues that were hot topics this session uh, that came up uh, that were not covered on our legislative priorities or the support opposed monitor list. And I wanted to just give each of these a little bit of, of commentary. So the first one is uh, the Blake bill regarding possession of controlled substances, which was passed in a special session on May 16th. The bill that passed made possession of controlled substances a gross misdemeanor subject to up to 180 day sentence for the first two uh, in, infractions and then on subsequent uh, after after the first two times, it would be 364 days. Um, and prosecutors uh, are, are uh, retain the control on whether or not diversion is used uh, for those infractions. Uh, second one is Senate Bill 5352 regarding vehicular pursuits. Um, this bill revisited the evidentiary threshold on when officers may engage in vehicular pursuits. Uh, in 2021, the legislature changed it from reasonable suspicion to probable cause. The leg uh, legislature sort of reversed that back to reasonable suspicion for um, specific crimes, so sexual assault, domestic violence, uh, violent crime, DUI, um, and a, a short list of other items. One of the big debates was whether or not auto theft should be on that list, and the legislature chose to not include auto theft on that list. 
Uh, another bill to make you aware of is Senate Bill 5272, which authorizes speed cameras on state highways. Uh, cities have the authority to use speed cameras on your local roadways. This provide that sa provides that same authority to the state on state highways. That stemmed from a lot of data presented to the legislature on the increasing number of traffic fatalities occurring in Washington state. They're at the highest they've been in several decades. Uh, the legislature uh, established several new policies for protections for gender affirming care, um, ab abortions, and reproductive rights. Uh, there were significant investments and policy changes made to increase nurse and behavioral health workforce. And just for fun, the state also declared the <laughs> Susiosaurus Rex the state dinosaur. So those are some of the <laughs> Uh, additional issues that came up. Again, we did not engage on these issues. We paid attention, we, we observed, we watched, but these were not items that were on your legislative agenda, um, but they are items we wanted to make you aware of. With that, um, I'm gonna conclude my summary of all of your topics and turn it over to Amy to talk about next steps. Uh, thank you for that summary, Brianna. So in terms of next steps, my hope is to engage with all of you and our departments early um, in building the next year's legislative agenda. Uh, as you saw from Brianna's summary that there are two components. There's these top priority items that really consume a significant amount of resources and energy and where Redmond is taking the lead. And so it was really apparent this session that the more work we put in up front to develop thoughtful targeted strategic priorities, the easier it will be for implementation. I mean, the implementation is hard, um, but seeing the path forward will be easier and giving us the um, talking points and the justifications that we really need to ensure uh, success during the session. And so then there's also the support oppose area. And that part of the agenda needs to have the ability for us to be nimble and react to bills because we can't predict, we can say what we want and then there's what actually happens. And so having that flexibility to respond and put our attention and resources where it's needed most in support of the city's articulated priorities um, is something we also hope to achieve as we look forward to 2024. So this summer, I'm gonna be inviting all of you to share ideas and priorities for next year. I understand you were surely gonna be starting that conversation early, which I super appreciate. Again, very appreciative of all the communication you've had flowing so far. Uh, we will be bringing a draft agenda back to you in September and aiming for adoption in November. And as we look forward to the 2024 session, that's going to be January 8th of next year. And it's going to be a short session. So this was a long session. It felt very long. Um, <laughs> the 60 day session will be focused on the supplemental budgets and bills that had not made it through this year. And some of those topics are going to be guided by their awareness that elections are going to be following that session. Um, and so that will play a role as well. And so we wanted to close by thanking, big thanks to the council members for your engagement. Huge thank you to our uh, district legislators on the 45th and 48th for their support in helping to get some of these across the finish line successfully this year. Thank you so much. And I would just say, me personally, thank you for all the engagement you had with us as council members, uh, inviting us to testify, letting us know as soon as you knew, keeping us up to date. I know some of those turnaround times for ability to testify were like 12 hours notice. So appreciate the nimbleness and all the hard work you all put in to that. Are there any comments from other council members or questions? Ms. Kritzer. I would echo our council president's uh, thanks to the, the two of you um, for all the efforts this session. Really exciting to see big priorities like Evans Creek as, as well as um, the legislation that, that we championed getting across the, the finish line. Really cool around the transportation uh, impact fees. I think that's going to be great for our projects and great for a lot of other cities. Some cities are going to thank us who didn't even advocate on it, but will later be able to use that tool for all kinds of really great trails and um, uh, non-on-roadway um, transportation paths. So I'm um, really excited to see us lead on that and to get it done in, a, in one session is, is really impressive. Um, and I, it, yeah, would be remiss to, to not thank all of our state legislators uh, for going to bat for us on so many of these things and really leading in so many areas. It's 
uh, cool to see them kind of being at the center of a lot of the the big um, big discussions of the session. And I also wanted to echo the thanks to Carol Helland, our planning staff, and, and those who, who weighed in, because um, I know I, I heard from folks uh, throughout the community in Olympia about um, how helpful uh, that, that work was. So just um, really glad to see that and glad to see the advancement of those housing bills um, in a way that, that worked for our city and, and for others. Um, so one question that I had for you is you mentioned on the list of things that weren't on our agenda uh, was um, around uh, gender affirming care, uh, health care and abortion care. My understanding was that we did add, add into our agenda after quite a bit of back and forth a, um, a line on support opposed that would allow us to advocate specifically around issues like reproductive health care since that was something our um, council sent to uh, the state legislature asking them to do and was something that, that I think we had yeah, that, so there was a, a bill that um, would have um, made a constitutional amendment around abortions, and we did sign in in support of that effort. Some of these other policies were a little bit um, tangential to that big picture item, um, and so we're kind of steeped in healthcare policy or other more detailed into the weeds elements where we're, the city isn't in a position to offer subject matter expertise or have much influence over those items. So we focused on the larger constitutional change that didn't advance forward. Cool, thank you and I appreciate that you signed in on behalf of our city on, on that bill. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, any other comments or questions? Mr. Fields. Help me understand the message on the 148th bicycle pedestrian overpass. That, I, I mean, I, I heard what you said. I get it, but they they allocated the money, but it's not available until 2029. Correct. So what is that? What would? How would? If somebody offered me money and said, "Here you go. Every, you, we've granted your request, but you can't use it for 10 years," I wouldn't know how to interpret that. Can you help me? understand the message that the legislature is giving us? So I think you, you are asking a great question because I think when the legislature approved the Move Ahead Washington package in 2022, I don't think there was broad awareness amongst uh, legislators who were not the small group that crafted the proposal that the projects that were funded in that package were not actually appropriated the funds and that that would be happening at a later date. So I think there is, um, I think this session was a lot of sort of news to many of like, oh wait, I thought this was funded last year through the Move Ahead Washington package. And the answer is like, well, no, it is funded through Move Ahead Washington. It will be funded at some point in the next 16 years. And the state is committed to allocating $8 million at some point in the 16 years. But each biennium, they will go through and specifically allocate for that biennium, here's what projects are getting what amount of funding. And they're developing a six-year timeline so that there is some predictability. It's not like we move from one project to another project to another project. They're more saying, here's the six-year timeline, and then they'll add a biennium each year. So there's, like, at some point, we're going to be like, okay, we know we're on the, we know we're on the list for this year, and we're nearing that date on when we can access those funds. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a kind of a big disappointment from the high of, hey, we got $8 million in this package to then, well, when are we going to get it? Not for quite some time. So just a quick follow-up. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit complaining or whining, but mostly I'm trying to be constructive. Is there something that we should be thinking about? And yeah. part of the reason I ask that is um, Councilmember Khan and I were just in Denver with two of the Redmond City staff members at a NACTO conference. Uh, one of the major themes throughout the entire week was um, micro mobility and alternatives to expensive cars and expensive insurance and expensive transportation uh, is in fact, um, lends itself to the equity issue of of helping those vulnerable communities. 
it's almost um, it's almost automatic that that those are the people who are relying on uh, the affordability benefit of uh, better transportation mm -hmm. than just owning a sixty thousand dollar car and paying six dollars a gallon for gas and yeah. two thousand dollars a year for insurance or whatever. So, if we need to step up our city understanding of how we're benefiting uh, those aspects of our community, I think we that's where we should focus our attention and sell that as best we can. Yeah, so I, I think the largest challenge we have is that there's no design for this project. There's not been like an alternatives analysis to even assess like here's the general structure of the project and there's no other dollars in. So it's an easy project for the state to kind of kick the can on when we're being compared to other projects where, you know, it's a project where the design is already done, um, there's, city, there's city or federal funds or county funds, there's other funds on the table that are at risk of being lost, uh, and there's a delivery schedule for that project that is, you know, in the immediacy or in the short term, uh, and factor in the equity criteria. I think our biggest obstacle with the project is about project readiness and funding match, and that we can make the arguments around equity, but that the, the biggest obstacle is around the project readiness. Yeah, that's fair, and I actually did push that part of what you said aside for a second, because I don't think that question really goes to you all. I think it goes to us and the city. Why would we make that a priority if we're not at least cannot demonstrate that it's more project ready and that we're willing to put up funding or get matching funding through the feds or somebody. Yeah. So I get it. All yeah. right, great, thank you. And I think that there was sort of a recognition on our team collectively with other city staff and others that, you know, we made this effort to try and make our case and realized, wow, this is gonna be pretty competitive and we need to reevaluate, regroup, think about what to do different as we move into 2024 and 2025, especially in light of the governor's statements about really wanting to dive in and reevaluate the spending schedule in the transportation budget. And council member, I'll add that I believe we're tracking your concern and I think you're absolutely right. That's part of the start early and look at what were the barriers this year. Where are the arguments? What does the one pager look like um, given what we know about the landscape this year? And so equity is part of that. The items that Brianna identified is part of that. And it's also staff and departments and all of you doing the homework in advance to thoughtfully figure out what are the priorities? What's going to be a good message? And that's part of my early often um, comment earlier is I think that with this under our belt, we have a better understanding of where the lay of that project is. So as you discuss the priorities, it's even where is this priority um, in the relative scheme of other things that are priority projects that are going to be uh, competitive at the state level? Yeah. No, and I appreciate that. And I, I heard that earlier. And I think that's spot on. Um, we have to be prepared to compete. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Check online. All right, seeing none, thank you so much for joining us and the comprehensive overview and all the hard work during the session. I know it was a long one and just appreciate all the many hours that you all put in to, to get us through. Well, it's an honor to be your advocate, um, an honor to work with really great city staff um, and to work with your stellar legislative delegation. I get to spend a lot of time with your legislators throughout session, um, and they're just really wonderful people that make this job a lot of fun. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Councilmember Kritzer. Just, uh, I wanted to make the suggestion if, if they want to stay at the table for the next discussion, it would be great to have them here. They have been invited to stay oh, if great. they would like to, <laughs> or to hang out in the audience and listen. All right, with that, we'll move on to our second agenda item, which is 2024 legislative brainstorm. So this item was brought forward because uh, council leadership really heard uh, that we wanted to have a touch point really early on in the drafting of the legislative uh, agenda. Um, this is a, uh, hopefully a collaborative experience where the two le legislative bodies will come together and agree on the legislative agenda, but um, we wanted to open up the floor for conversation since um, sometimes it feels like these, these kind of get 
uh, these kind of happen quickly. So wanted to open up for ideas. I think the 148th conversation that we just had is a perfect opportunity for us to bounce some ideas, talk about how we see that, um, and if anyone has anything that they'd like to kick us off with otherwise, I'm open to it. Councilmember Anderson. Got a tricky mic here, I'll just hold it. Um, I uh, We talked a little bit at the council retreat about the possibility of ranked choice voting mm -hmm. and uh, I did some research with Jason on that, and it turns out there's a um, prohibition for our type of city because we are not chartered. Uh, so I would like to see, and hopefully council will support, uh, either a support oppose issue, if that ends up going back to the state legislature, um, so either a resolution or something like that to, uh, in support of frank choice voting, which would be a change in state law to allow it. Great, that's excellent feedback, thank you. Any other ideas? Councilmember Carson. I absolutely hate ranked choice voting. It is not appropriate. Um, it's, I mean, just, you can look at some of the outcomes and see that, that it is, I don't even know what to, how to describe it, but it's voodoo. Um, it, <laughs> it is, it, it has a lot of problems with, um, it, it isn't the true will of the people. And I, I think for that reason, we, we should not support um, it, the, a change in, in state law. Um, you can look at examples of where the, per, the person with the most votes actually didn't win the election. So uh, I, 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 honestly, I just don't see, we have a primary system for a reason. You whittle it down to two people, then obviously you get you know, one is able to get a majority or or um, or not. So um, I I think it's a terrible idea. Thank you. Any other comments on rake choice voting? No. Con uh, Councilmember Kritzer. I have a different issue, but I would say it seems uh, reasonable to, to look at whether cities have the option to do that. Um, and that's what I would understand that legislation to be, um, just in giving us the ability to decide how we do our voting. Um, Before we move on to your next one. You're, you're moving, Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, on the ranked choice voting, I also think that um, I would also be in support of cities being able to make that designation for themselves and supporting that idea. Um, so. Go ahead. On a separate topic, I think one that I brought up as we were um, doing our legislative agenda last time, and I had some extensive conversations uh, with Amy and Brianna around this topic, is just um, how we think about uh, the kind of home rule principle or um, the idea around um, our own local control versus state and how that um, balances with the priorities that we list. Because obviously sometimes the state legislature makes policies that are gonna override um, our own local control because they set certain standards and set a standard for all cities. And that is something that is um, kind of in our legislative agenda as an important principle. And sometimes it just comes into conflict. And so it's something that I think would be interesting for us to work on continuing to create more of a process around um, when we have issues where there is a little bit of that um, tension between the things we put on our list, for example, like housing, as wanting to expand um, policies around housing access and affordability, um, but that means the state making certain policies, for example, that are um, providing certain uh, uh, mandates to cities, um, how we kind of think about that and how we engage with the mayor and staff on that. I think this session, it seemed like we, um, we improved the process, we heard a lot more feedback and on issues where the council didn't have consensus. Um, we didn't engage as, as strongly, like for example, on the Blake decision, um, that was one where we, we didn't necessarily um, have our city like front and center on that one. Um, but on things like the housing policy where we had a really strong opinion, our city was able to engage on that while also 
navigating, you know, what, how we could make sure the policy is best for our city as well. So um, anyway, something that I would love to bring up in advance of, of um, the next time and not kind of at the 11th hour to have that discussion, especially given that I think AWC and SEA also really um, prioritize that. And I think one of the other issues that we might want to talk about is just um, whether there's any sort of language we want to add to our agenda while we support AWC and SEA's agendas. Sometimes we disagree with them and how we um, are able to articulate that um, on our legislative agenda, I think would be interesting. Thank you. Councilmember Fields. So there were uh, two bullet points on the presentation that we just saw uh, that sort of struck me as interesting. Um, one was putting speed cameras on our state highways. Um, uh, and as our legislative analyst mentioned, uh, and I think it was attributed to the governor, uh, the concern over the rising fatalities on our highways, uh, that was again echoed in Denver over and over and over every day um, about not just the number of fatalities rising nationwide, but the number of injuries, the number of uh, life changing injuries, um, the, the cost is horrendous. So I would like to see um, this city advocate for safer highways. And if that means uh, doing something that not that long ago I was way against, which was speed cameras, uh, monitoring driving behavior out there. I think, uh, yes, they are allowed to do it, but I think the city can advocate, go do it, and uh, change the trajectory of um, the, the weight of cars and the speed of cars is literally killing families and people across our entire nation, including the state of Washington. I don't know about the city of Redmond, but um, we are part of, uh, of a network of highways. I would like for the city to advocate for enforcement. Thank you. Councilmember Anderson. I have one uh, that I'd love to see back, which is the uh, procurement policy or the supply chain uh, responsibility. Um, I hope, I'm hope i hopeful that will be reframed and, and brought back up, and I am channeling a little bit of Ms. Stewart, because she seemed pretty excited about that one, so uh, I would support that as well. Can you tell me a little more about that, because I don't, I don't recall. I heard it in the presentation about supplier responsibility for um, like materials take back programs and sort of the um, waste generation issue. Um, that's about as much as I know about it, but I think that it's important to understand how our waste stream works and make sure that there's some sort of take back responsibility. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Kritzer. I think that that bill was the RAP Act. Yes. Um, this past that, session. That makes, that tracks. Got it. Um, I will add mine. Um, I was I was looking at the local control issue as well. I think um, I think having more clear language is probably the right way to go on that on that item. A lot of the times we default to you know it, if it's convenient or not, and sometimes we use local control as a default. So I think having a little more clarity around what aspects of local control would be helpful. Um, and then as well with the AWC um, supporting their legislative agenda, there are times when we, when, they're, when we have conflict. So I think having more clarity around that on our one pager or um, I, know we're, I know we wanna keep things high level and I know we wanna stay at, um, focusing on only a few major things to, to uh, lobby and advocate for, but I think when, where we can be more clear on some of those general support opposed, I think that would be uh, prefer, preferable for, for me. Councilmember Kritzer. This isn't for the upcoming legislative session, but for the next biennial budget session. Um, I think an interesting uh, thing that happened this session was having the first go round of applying the Climate Commitment Act dollars um, to different projects. And so I just think it would be interesting for us as we think about 
our capital budgeting and um, what what is kind of our capital ask going forward that if there are any that could be funded through future Climate Commitment Act dollars since we have so many um, climate environmental focused um, projects and initiatives in our city or things that we might like to do that um, that would be really greater as we think about kind of what local community projects we might want to have funded. Um, just being able to, in advance of the next capital budget, identify um, a, a little bit more of, of what are some that might align really well to some funding sources out there um, within the budget. So, and in particular, I think on climate, there's a, a cool opportunity for us to um, take a look at, at some of the innovative ideas and match them to state funds. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Fields. So, I think that um, Councilmember Kritzer is right, even though she did jump ahead a year. But, <laughs> um, and since we're since she did it, I'm going to do it. I, um, you know, uh, Councilmember Carson made a comment in the prior meeting about the MOC being really an environmental um, sustainability potential project. Mm -hmm. uh, from what I heard, I, I, I'm, I'm supporting and agreeing completely with Councilmember Kritzer. I think that we need to start identifying those kinds of projects. We're going to need help um, making that transition and making that transformation to a more sustainable um, city and community. Uh, I think the MOC should be looked at. I think from what I heard uh, earlier today, th that may be uh, become more expensive than what we thought, and we may need state help in order to do it right, so. Yeah, thank you. I think I would just add on uh, the 148th um, bike ped bridge conversation I'm definitely interested in hearing what we as a city can do to um, put some money behind that so that when that conversation does come up probably in the 25 timeline um, we we can show we're putting our money where our mouth is and we're putting that funding in i can't tell you how many times i've seen someone nearly get taken out by a car trying to walk through that intersection and it's it's real scary and i know that we as a city are behind that project um, I think we just need to show the state that we are deserving of that money and we are behind that project 100%. So whatever we can do to make that happen as well in that timeline to maybe get that sooner. Any other items for this? Councilmember Fields. Yeah, one last one. Um, there was also an, a bullet point on the presentation about a ban on assault weapons actually did not track that. I didn't, I'm sure it was in the press. I'm sure it had some heated discussion. Um, but I, I think that's another area from a public safety perspective, from protecting our school perspective. Uh, I think I, I personally don't understand why anybody needs an assault weapon, uh, a banning assault weapons at state level, I'm completely in favor of and uh, whatever additional um, work can be done in that area, I think that we should look at and understand. Thank you. I do believe that was our very own Senator Cooter that brought that forward. All right. I think that brings us to the end of that item. If there are no other things for discussion. Thank you, everyone. We will move on to our third agenda item, which is the 2023 Council Priority Results and Discussion. Councilmember Kritzer was going to share our list. Thank you all for um, filling out the survey. And uh, Councilmember Kritzer and I met a couple of times to go over everything. We, we have a column here of the CSP connection, so we wanted to make sure that um, we that all of our items had some sort of identification to the work that we have committed ourselves to. And then compared to last year, we actually spent some time and um, pointed out where these are uh, united with current efforts that the staff is already working on. Um, so we did a first pass at that. I hope you've all had a chance to, to look at these. But first, I just wanted to see if Anyone had any um, items that they found as a bit surprising as to how they ranked? Um, for me personally, I found it interesting that our number one 
uh, ranking priority on this was our first last Metro Flex Transit service ranked as number one for all of us. So I found that very interesting. I know with light rail arrival, um, we're all very mindful of that right now. But if anyone else had some observations, I'd open up the floor. Go ahead. How were these ranked? How, how did the numbers come up? So this was our, our same uh, zero through three that we did last um, in 2022. Um, so yeah. And then, the, and then we tallied up the math from there. Councilmember Fields? So let's talk about that. Um, number one priority ranking, right? First, last mile. Uh, um, I'm not sure if I'm surprised or unsurprised. I do think it's something that the city has talked about mm -hmm. um, many, many months and years, but I'm not sure. I've yet to see something uh, meaningful um, begin to emerge as to how to solve that problem. Uh, every, and, and if you talk to many people in the community, uh, that is a, an issue uh, for those that don't live on the corridor or those who uh, are concerned about um, being able to use this asset that's coming to us. So. Um, I think that's one where we have to begin to provide, the council needs to provide um, our leadership discussions and um, work with the mayor and collaborate with the mayor's staff to find um, an array of solutions. Uh, again, uh, not to go back to the NACTO conference in Denver, but that is all, this was also an issue. Mm -hmm. Uh, there were driverless buses that would go on a route that could pick up um, people through their smartphones. They didn't have to stop at a bus stop. That's really helpful for somebody who is blind or just coming out of their house and can't really get to the bus stop but wants to get to light rail. Uh, there was uh, a lot of work around uh, bike share and scooter share and uh, a system uh, that really did in fact support the disadvantage. There had to have been an element of uh, supporting that vulnerable community uh, in achieving that transportation goal. So it's, um, I don't know that we've done that with our scooter share where we've actually made specific uh, strides in making that a, a viable um, commuting tool. So I, I think this is something uh, that we all know about. I think it is a priority. And I, I think there should be a, a sense of urgency around this priority. I, th I think that's exactly what this shows, is that we all think this is one of the most urgent issues for us. Um, council leadership did identify that these conversations are happening within Redmond 2050, the TMP, and the Transit Strategic Plan. But hearing some of these ideas that you've learned at the, the conference you just attended, I would love to hear more about some of these, because I do think some of those alternatives are things that we, we need to look into as a council and we need to study. Um, I know there's been some uh, concerns with the scooter share um, as far as where they get left, but Maybe there's something we can do with um, subsidizing low-income folks that need to use those options. Um, but I think, I think this is where the conversation gets interesting for us as a council. And I look forward to, to continuing that work this and showing that we, this is a priority for council leadership to make sure that these conversations have space to, to get talked about. Councilmember Kurtzer. Yeah, and I, I think that, you know, making sure with uh, the way that we were talking about how do we use this document that, especially for ones that are a part of some existing efforts, but maybe we don't get a deep dive on this particular topic all the time, just making sure that we get those um, on the agenda, you know, within within this year so we, we are kind of having those discussions, I think, is um, a way to be able to use this document. Um, I, on, on first last mile, I do think that it's an interesting area because it combines a couple different 
things that, that we're working on, like the scooter share, which I, I believe we still have to make permanent. So that's an interesting policy yeah. that will, because I think it's still in pilot, and that's one where it'll be a really a step forward we could take if we want to look at that or look at any expansion of micromobility options. Another thing that um, I feel like, I know that, I think, I believe our staff told us that in, we need to create the transit strategic plan in order to be eligible for Metro to do some of that first last mile, like, shuttle type of services. But I do know that some of our neighboring communities have gotten pilots um, around that. And I, I, I think it's an interesting area if there's a lot of council interest to figure out, you know, what do we want to do and, and how could we advocate to be able to um, be a pilot city for um, more of these projects, especially it, this speaks as well to the fact that um, when we look at, at both kind of how transit um, and uh, moving around our city and housing are at the top. I think it speaks to the fact that we're all, we all have light rail on the mind and the mm -hmm. fact that um, it's coming in and we want to be able to connect people in our communities into it as well as be able to live near it, or at least that's from my <laughs> perspective, um, you know, a key area that's covered by a lot of these top priorities. Councilman Reyerson. I don't know if you would like to wrap this conversation. I have a question. Sure. Um, the, pres the as presented, I'm having trouble understanding what the outcome is that we're looking for mm -hmm. and if it's a governance issue, if it's about a budget item or an activity. Um, so I would love that clarification to be added or um, sure. so uh, discussed in the context of this. That's part of what we want to discuss here. Um, the last time we did this document, it really helped staff see where council's priorities were for budgeting since we're not in a budget year. Um, this just is currently being talked about and was proposed to be used as um, a way to keep the conversations between the two legislative bodies moving to show where council's priorities lie and to, um, to kind of give us a, a more clear guiding document of what we are really using or showing as our top priorities and also gives us an opportunity to propose some of our other ideas that and see like a litmus test for if there's other council members in support. Given that, um, if your idea is on here and it ranks low, that's okay. You can still use the council hopper form that we just submitted and um, submit supporting documentation. I know some of these ideas were, were tossed out with not um, a ton of background information, like mine, for example, was um, gig workers policy. And it didn't necessarily rank very high, but um, if, I, if I brought forward more documentation through the hopper process, then maybe we could reevaluate to see if that's something that would get greater support. Yes. So quick follow up, quick follow -up on that. Um, to column D here shown, if there's no existing action, should we assume that it's a new proposal? Not necessarily, not necessarily, Council. I can't remember what the title of the column is. We just identified places that we saw current it effort. in current efforts. Okay, thank you. I would say more or less the ones that don't have it are either um, a new, well, they're not plugging into something existing, so they would be new, or we also are gonna um, do a process to get director comments, so there might be a few of these that council leadership didn't know we just did it to kind of get uh, general um, bucketing but um, we are going to get some comments so if there there may be a few of these that that show up with nothing that actually turns out we didn't even know that the the staff was working on so i think that's um, the one caveat but um, and then there are some that plug into like i think for example the um single-use food service reduction policy. Um, we actually looked back in the ESAP and realized that that is in our ESAP. Mm -hmm. um, but it will be new because we haven't done it yet. Um, so the thing we've done on it is say that we want to do it. Yep. Um, so that's that's an example of, of some that are kind of new but in, in process. And it's, and it's in the ESAP, but I think it was spec'd for further out. So since it's ranking pretty high on our list, that this gives us this, the opportunity to potentially push it forward and say this is actually really important to us. Councilmember Fields. So I think Councilmember Anderson makes a pretty good point, and and I understood your response. 
um, I think the question is, we, we can talk about how we feel about all these priorities, but the question is, what are we going to do? And, uh, and maybe the creation of a scorecard, uh, you, you know, is this a budget item? Is this an oversight item? Is this a policy? Is this a ordinance? Um, or not, uh, not that we make that decision, but those decisions about these priorities need to be made at some point. Mm -hmm. So I think, and if I understood you correctly, it's a communication tool for us on council, but ultimately it's a communication tool for council and mayor and staff. Mm -hmm. So w when does this become uh, um, a more optimal tool for communication between us and the director's team and the mayor? That's w what do we need to add to this or what do we need to subtract from it or enhance? That's really kind of, I, I, that's what I took away from Councilmember Anderson's question yeah. and your response. Yeah. Um, so. As we grow this process, that's kind of what we're trying to figure out, right? Okay. Um, is we saw it be very helpful in the budget conversation um, for last year. And in this second non-budget year, we're trying to figure out how some of the priorities that are still in the 22 document, how they've pulled into where they've landed, all the work that's been done, and being that clear communication tool between the bodies so that we know what's happening in the background and we have more transparency on that. Um, but continuing to grow this and morph this into something that's even bigger and better and a tool that we can all utilize, that's the conversation we're having right now. What else can we do to make this a better process? Right, so speaking just for me. Sure. I am perfectly happy and more than willing to uh, take on a homework assignment, um, taking this list and actually creating uh, some action-oriented recommendations. Sure. And if other council members did that, then we could then evolve this list into something a little more uh, directive. Yeah. Not to get in trouble with directive. No. <laughs> <laughs> but more something. Councilmember Kurtzer. Yeah, I would say I think um, we did add CSP connection as one of the kind of categories so that you can see there's a couple that that don't really align to a CSP category and that's interesting. And, and a lot of them are like how we do council things, they're more about council processes or about budgeting related things. So um, I think that's interesting. Yeah, I think the one thing that, that we had thought about in terms of this being more of like a guiding document is that there are some things in here, like I think about last year's use of the list, which was you know our first try on it, where there were some things where we started on and we said, go ahead, and then we got partway down the road and then realized, oh wait, there wasn't actually uh, once everyone learned more about certain ideas, then there wasn't enough will to actually get certain things done. Although it was a great tool to get a lot of things done. So, um, so I think there it does need to be a step in the process for any of these uh, that, that aren't already something that's ongoing, like some of the net new ideas where people can bring the thing forward and get it, make sure to get that, that gut check of is, it, is there enough interest to move forward on this? Um, and that's why I think probably the green ones are good ones to do that that exercise that Councilmember Fields came up with. Um, and I think even just breaking down, really pulling out which ones are very new things versus very plugged into what is already on our agenda, we'd probably come up with a much smaller list. Um, so, and then we could do a discussion of that, of like what are our, if we only have time to do three net new things or something. Um, since when I think about some of the things we did last year, it took a lot of time, like tenant protections, for example, took a good amount of time or, um, you know, Vision Zero took some time. Like, But we did those and we had them on the list. We moved those forward and now we're building on them. So, um, you know, if we wanted to kind of pull out a honed list of those newer things and figure out what, how many of those we want to try to put as new on the agenda, that would be interesting to me. And I think a lot of the things that we're seeing that ranked 
fairly high are, are not on that, on that new, net new list. So that was interesting, an interesting discovery for me. Councilmember Carson. Thank you. So uh, I wanted to go back to the <coughs> single use food service. Sure. Um, and I, I, um, I was kind of stunned and surprised today when I got a, a beverage um, at a drive through and it was styrofoam. And I just, I hate, I hate styrofoam. It's, it's so hard to, to recycle. Um, and I know we, we do with, with Ridwell contracts, we, but who, who's gonna hang on to their, their styrofoam cup to recycle it? It's just not gonna happen. Um, and so one of the things I was just thinking is maybe, maybe we, you know, when we dig into a couple, of, as we dig into things, maybe looking at staging things so that it's a progression because um, I, I really, I mean, I wouldn't be upset if we banned styrofoam outright in the city uh, in businesses, business use. Now, obviously, we would want to get feedback, but there, there are so many alternatives that it's, it's not really even, it's not a cost issue anymore. It's not a, it, it's simply, I mean, it, I guess maybe it's, maybe there you could save you know, fractional amounts on things. I don't know, I don't actually know what styrofoam costs because I never buy it. But um, I, I do think that if we're gonna do something like that, it needs to be predictable. It needs to be super straightforward. And we, we kind of lay, you know, lay, lay down some progressional um, <clears throat> plateaus to, to hit. So maybe it's first it's styrofoam and then it's, you know, then you have to go to compostable um, and basically everything compostable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've said, I don't know how many times about our own events, like we can't even do that for our own events, which we should be able to do. And, um, I, and I think that, that um, you know, Parks is, is moving that along the continuum. So um, I'm glad to see that. But again, I think it's, if we don't provide some product, um, some predictability for businesses, but you know, do the right thing and and do it in maybe in stages, so it's not such a a shock and <clears throat> start moving along the line to to get to where we want to be. So, because um, like I, I can totally support that. I I really I I, I just loathe styrofoam. It's mm -hmm. it's just I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why I I. I Honestly, it's it's something that we just don't need to use, and but from the demand side, they're not going to stop producing it until nobody demands it. So, yeah. does does anyone know if the styrofoam ban at the state level passed or even continued being brought forward? I know there was one. No, I don't know. Okay, in our in our in our. <laughs> It, it happened right after the plastic bag ban. It was being introduced, and then I don't know what happened with it. Did it pass? Well, it, maybe there's a timeline we need to look yeah, into of when yeah. that was. Well, anyway, yeah. I mean, it'd be interesting to to kind of know, okay, what's the state doing on it? What, you know, what do we want to do on it? <clears throat> um, because, you know, to me, we're not going to make any progress on a couple of the things that I'm kind of passionate about um, if we don't start somewhere, mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Thanks. Council Member Kritzer. Yeah, I, I would say um, looking at this list, I think out of all the top priorities, the highest ranked, one of the highest ranked ones that are a new, kind of net new thing would be doing that single use food service reduction uh, policy. Uh, plastic, I said food, food service, but I think it's supposed to be plastic uh, single use food product. Yeah, 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 anyway. Um, but uh, but I think um, Councilmember Stewart isn't here and I think this was her proposal. But I, I, would, I would propose to the council if um, there is a lot of interest in this that we ask Councilmember Stewart to mm -hmm. do the first top reform or uh, if, if she wants to. But I think it, it would be a good one. As, as Councilmember Carson mentioned, I think it's one of those ones where we could really try to do a very thoughtful process on it to be able to study what other jurisdictions are doing. I know there are some model ordinances um, that we could look at because a bunch of our neighboring 
cities in, in Washington have done this. Um, we could look at uh, the impacts, and we could also begin conversations with our business community about kind of how how we would implement um, this. So um, anyway, I, I would support um, bringing this forward for a future study session and consideration. Mm -hmm. And I believe Issaquah actually already has this policy in place. So we could look at our neighbors there as well. All right, any further discussion? If we could scroll to the orange section, I um, just wanted to note that um, CO Files and I looked at, looked at the big green list and we also considered the orange list. Um, and a lot of these are already things that are underway and in the process, so, um, just, just to note that a lot of this stuff does align with things we're already working on. Um, so maybe it was the nine. Maybe it was the nine section. Sorry. That's that's what it was. I take that back. So it was. Uh, we were trying to figure out where where to make that breaking point in this document, and we looked at the the things that ranked as a number nine and they all seemed like they were already currently underway. So it was um, important enough for us to keep those in the highly important and um, they're already being worked on. So the lift, you know how last time we had, is this a heavy lift, a light lift, a moderate lift? Um, we considered these as being active and not a heavy lift. So we will send this document to um, director's team for comments and for their feedback, just like we did with the prior versions. Uh, in this document, which is on the SharePoint, you can actually see the last two, we have tabs on the bottom of this document here. So you can see all of the updates. Um, uh, CO Files actually updated this as recently as, um, I think, this month. So if you have time to go through and read um, some status updates, um, that'll give you a really good idea of where we landed on a lot of these things that are still very important to us that do get carried forward into the 2023 priorities. But it, it's just a nice tool to use to be able to continue the, the transparency so we all know where things are currently at. Councilmember Carson. Quick update, I, I just looked it up and sure enough, um, so packing peanuts are actually banned as of next month. Oh, nice. Um, and then other styrofoam like cups and things are a year away. So One 20, year? June of 2024. Got it. Thank you. So, yeah. So never mind. <laughs> well, we, we I do think there's that other policy, work. Yeah, I do think that yeah. policy um, had other elements to it aside from styrofoam, so. Councilmember Kritzer, were you going to add something else? No. Okay. Oh, I was just going to say uh, the policy would also include plastic in yeah. addition to styrofoam. So. And I think it also included uh, bringing your own container so that you could have your carry out, your like to go food in your own glass container or something like that. So, Councilmember Fields. So, one last comment on this. And um, I'm thinking um, in terms of the legislative report that we just got. And, and I've heard a number of council members say over the years, you know, um, you can't do everything all at once at the same time. I know there was a movie where they did that, but we can't do that. So these, we have to, in, in my mind, in this list, do the work that you're describing, but at some point, um, the city collectively has to come together and say, here's our top three, four priorities. We're not just gonna put them on a piece of paper. We're gonna monitor the progress. We're going to make sure uh, that we understand uh, the updates that would Im influence those things. They have to be uh, you know, fully managed. So I don't know what those those priorities are, but I, I believe since um, in the spirit of what you've asked for on your agenda memo, I think that w that has to be a goal of ours is to sort of pare this down and not pare it down, but carve it out uh, those three or four items that we really are going to make sure that we not only call priorities, but we treat them like priorities. Mm -hmm.
Do you think from what we just reviewed that the top green items fall appropriately into those that bucket of things that we should then whittle down into looking at as our? I, I don't know, but I will give you an answer. Okay. At some point soon. I appreciate it. Thank you. Councilmember Kritzer. Well, one suggestion, I think it's, it's a really good point, is, um, you know, that we did our community strategic plan and came up with, with those priorities, and those were longer, and I think the, when we came up with this new process, it was an effort to get down to kind of, um, you know, what do we want to do in the next year or two, but um, we haven't necessarily... Um, married those two documents. And so it might be time now that we've had the last two years we've been iterating on this to revisit, which I, we've talked about as council leadership, you know, when are we gonna revisit the community strategic plan to make sure that if there's anything in here that's not really articulated in the strategic plan that it aligns and if there's any adjustments that need to be made to the strategic plan mm -hmm. from what we realize as we start to do the work and we see what we're all coalescing around that, um, it's it's there because that's really the document that we use the most to share out with our community about our priorities. And I I think you had stepped away in our meeting. Um, the CO files is reviewing our CSP community strategic plan, and that will be brought to council leadership in the next um, couple of months. And this document is going to be reviewed as part of the the updates and um, looking at filling in some of those those gaps that we identified the last time around. So it's all feeding together. Okay, any further comments on this topic? All right, seeing none, we are moving right along to item number four, and which is council talk time. Are there any items for discussion? Council Member Kritzer. I guess this is a little bit from the last item, but I just wanted to check in. Did anyone have any questions? I know that Council President Forsyth sent out um, the follow-up on the new Hopper form um, that we got from um, Mr. Haney, who overall thought that the process would work with OPMA as long as, as I, I think Council President Forsyth put in uh, <laughs> highlighting that you send directly to Jason your um, topic instead of sending to council leadership so we don't unintentionally create an open public meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I just wanted to flag that I think if everyone is good at this meeting with the, the first, the form of it, that, you know, we can start using it. But mm -hmm. I, I did want to just give the opportunity in case anyone had any final thoughts or questions on it. I think we can obviously iterate, but. Yeah. Does it, do the items that are coming on this hopper list get added to that survey list? So that is one um, area where, when it br gets brought forward for us for, to, to discuss, we can decide there's a whole box at the bottom of the hopper form for us to figure out what the potential after action is. One of those items is doing our ranking system and adding it to the, uh, the list we just looked at. Uh, one is also, say, sending it out for legal review or having um, some staff time potentially dedicated. So, so yes and. Councilman Fields. Uh, so I'm, I think at the end of what I'm going to say, I'm looking for uh, council leadership to provide guidance. So I'm I'm the ombuds for May. Uh, one of the key, one of the most emotional issues that came up, and there was public testimony at our last business meeting. We have a um, public disclosure request from a former mayor on this topic, and there has been a lot of press and discussion and some very. Uh, harsh words exchanged in emails to council over this, and that is uh, the work of the salary commission. Um, I am certain that we all uh, have kept our distance from this as we should have, and um, I'm disappointed in how this pro how how this has manifested publicly, I don't think anybody should be shamed or called ludicrous or uh, the, the work needs to be done by the volunteers. The city needs to do their part of the work. Um, 
And it's not clear to me what the process is going forward, even this earlier, prior to this meeting, we got another request from a different former mayor saying uh, disband the commission as if, I guess she assumes that council has the authority to do that. So the question is, can council leadership go find out from the city attorney and the mayor and whoever what council's role is uh, an individual council member's role would be uh, as this um, transitions into some sort of completion. I'm completely uh, aghast at how this has been handled and I think that we need to calm down and I just wanna know what council's role is. Yes. I will, I will have that conversation with um, Council Vice President and we will get something to our city attorney so that we have clear direction on what, if any, our role is in that process. And I would agree with you that um, shaming our volunteers and uh, for the way the process has gone is not something that holds true to our values as a city. Um, and. Um, we definitely need to understand what our our responsibilities are here in this, if any. Thank you. Councilmember Anderson. Just a quick, oh. quick follow-up <laughs> comment on this. Um, a request would be uh, another uh, sort of problem that was presented to us uh, to reassure staff council does manage the budget. And so I um, would like to make sure that we have an opportunity to get a touch for any adjustments to the budget that might be made in the finance committee. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. Councilmember Kritzer. Yeah, and, and I, I, I will um, join Council President Forsyth in looking at that. And, and I agree with... Um, Councilmember Anderson, that I think before any uh, staffing decisions were, are made or budgetary related decisions are made um, uh, after the salary commission, I assume, make their decision, um, that council uh, be engaged in that discussion. And so I think finding out what our role can be in this is, is important. Absolutely. Thank you. Councilmember Khan. Thank you so much. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank council leadership for making this council hopper uh, a reality. It was something I brought up during the council retreat um, and uh, something that I've been very passionate about since I joined council. And I know um, is really something that um, was inspired by a number of conversations that we've actually had as a council over the last few years um, and, you know, trying to figure out how this very imaginative legislative body can have um, a stronger input uh, and um, and be able to have a place for a lot of these great ideas and conversations we have um, as you know we bring up new ideas on council whether it's you know a resolution or whether it's um, you know a new program or you know our you know a lot of the great ideas that we've even heard tonight just being able to have a home and a process for it so Super, super thankful to council leadership for making this happen um, and excited to see how this pans out. Uh, the form looks really great. Uh, I think I kind of agree with council member Anderson. Only thing I would suggest is maybe even a, a, a section in there related to budget, um, kind of like our agenda memos, agenda memos uh, a section that might just be like a yes, no checkbox that indicates whether or not this would have a budget impact. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes we'll just have like a resolution or uh, a letter that we want to send to the state legislature or something like that, which obviously would not have a budget impact. But, you know, especially for some of the ideas that would require more extensive staff conversation and um, maybe any supplemental items in our budget or an idea for a future um, budget as well, too, if we're thinking long term um, to be able to kind of just have a home to be able to initiate some of those conversations, even if we don't have that exact number already fleshed out. So that's kind of the only suggestion I have. And uh, yeah, very excited to see how this um, pans out. And again, hopefully to be able to support future legislative you know, bodies, future councils as well to kind of bring forward some of these great um, ideas that we, that we have. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, concerns? 
Okay, seeing none, that brings us to the end of our agenda. If there is no objection, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>